is EM Cases EM Quick Hits Podcast. Quick, let's get on with it. EM Cases is part of SHREMI, the Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute. That's the nonprofit organization dedicated to improving EM care through high quality research and education. The opinions expressed on this podcast are intended for general information and educational purposes only and should not be used to diagnose, treat, or prevent any medical condition, nor should they be used as a substitute for medical advice from a qualified practicing physician. Unless stated otherwise, the opinions expressed by the hosts or guests are made in their individual capacity, not on behalf of the Institute nor Medicine Cases. For anyone out there who's interested in a leadership role or aspires to one, don't miss this year's EDAC, the ED Administration Conference. It's Canada's foremost annual meeting for ED nursing and physician leaders and hospital system administrators, and one of the very few meetings of its kind globally. This year, it's again all virtual, so you can attend from anywhere. It'll be Monday, November 7th, and will feature prominent speakers and topics relevant to today's challenges. And of special note to many of us, Brian Goldman will deliver the first Paul Hannum Memorial Lecture and discuss the importance of teamwork to all we do. Full info and links to register on the EM Cases website. Hey, EM Cases listeners, this is Salim Rezai with another Best of Rebel EM. And today we're going to be talking about venothromboembolism recurrence in subsegmental PEs. What is the actual risk? So we know that the overall mortality and case fatality rate for pulmonary embolism seems to be decreasing over time. Yet, we're reporting more and more PE, suggesting that maybe we're overdiagnosing pulmonary embolisms. Furthermore, management with anticoagulation is not an entirely benign strategy and places a potential risk of bleeding upon patients. Now, the management of subsegmental PE remains controversial and is lacking supporting evidence to guide treatment. Some people believe anticoagulation is unnecessary in subsegmental PEs and that these will lice automatically with little patient consequences. However, there's another camp of people who proclaim that patients with subsegmental PEs should receive anticoagulation due to the high risk of recurrence and potential morbidity. The American College of Chess Physicians Clinical Practice Guideline recommends surveillance instead of anticoagulation in patients with subsegmental PEs without DVT. Now, without high-quality evidence, it's difficult to assess the pros and cons of anticoagulation in this patient population. So what is the risk of recurrent VTE in patients with subsegmental PEs without DVTs who are not on anticoagulation? The paper we're going to be talking about today is by Legal et al., Risk for Recurrent Venous Thromboembolism in Patients with Subsegmental Pulmonary Embolism Managed Without Anticoagulation, a multi-center prospective cohort study in the Annals of Internal Medicine 2022. So what did they do? Well, the title of their paper was the Subsegmental Pulmonary Embolism Study, or SSPE for short. This was a multi-center prospective management cohort study that enrolled almost 300 patients from 18 centers. Patients with DVTs were excluded from primary analysis and anticoagulated. If patients had distal DVTs, anticoagulation was left up to the treating physician. After DVTs were excluded, only 266 enrolled patients were included in the primary analysis. It's important to know what the exclusion criteria were here, and that is patients with active cancer, having a history of venous thromboembolism, requiring oxygen therapy to maintain an SpO2 of greater than 92%, other indications for long-term anticoagulation, pregnancy, anticoagulated before enrollment, and hospitalized at the time subsegmental PE was diagnosed. Their primary outcome was recurrent venothromboembolism within 90 days. So the critical results, patients that had a venothromboembolism recurrence with subsegmental PEs without DVT was 3.1%. Half of these were pulmonary embolisms, half of these were DVTs. As far as major bleeding, there was only a 0.7% outcome here, and for minor bleeding, it was 1.4%. So a few points of discussion. The investigators found a higher than expected level of recurrent venothromboembolism, but the good news is no patients with recurrent venothromboembolism had a fatal pulmonary embolism. The final point is that the rate of major and minor bleeding was relatively small, but only 26 out of 292 patients were analyzed for this secondary outcome and were actually anticoagulated. We could assume that there could be a higher rate of bleeding in a larger comparative group on anticoagulation. So what's the bottom line? Well, it looks like recurrence of venothromboembolism in subsegmental PE may be more common than we once originally thought. 
However, the good news is that subsegmental PEs appear to be non-fatal based on this study. My practice is that in patients with risk factors such as DVTs, multiple subsegmental PEs, or recurrent pulmonary embolism, treatment is probably warranted until we see better data. In all other patients, it's most likely going to be a shared decision-making strategy. Thanks so much, Dr. Rosé. An excellent synopsis of an important study. Dr. Kirsten DeWitt, one of Canada's EM thrombosis experts, gave a talk on PE at the last EM Cases Summit. And her practical recommendation for treatment of subsegmental PEs was to go ahead and anticoagulate, unless, of course, they had obvious contraindications, and have them follow up in your internal medicine or hematology or thrombosis clinic within a week, if you can. Her reasoning is based on similar data that we just heard about and the fact that bleeding complications are near zero for patients who are anticoagulated for just a few days. The bleeding risks really only become significant with longer-term anticoagulation. But if you don't have quick access to a specialist clinic, then I think Dr. Rosé's recommendations based on this latest study, that is, to anticoagulate if they have risk factors and to do the shared decision-making thing for everyone else, is perfectly reasonable. All right, next up, we have our trauma expert, Dr. Andrew Petrosoniak, otherwise known as Petro, who's going to tell us a bit about analgesia for the trauma patient. Today, we're going to talk about pain management and trauma. I think there's a bit more to it than just give the patient some morphine and move on. Pain's frequently under-recognized and inadequately managed, so listen on for a framework and approach that actually benefits the patient while hopefully balancing the potential hemodynamic concerns. We'll start with the case. A 43-year-old male involved in an ATV rollover. He has multiple closed fractures, including a mid-shaft femur fracture, rib fractures, and a both bone forearm fracture. Patient's in C-spine precautions, the pelvis is stable. There's no other substantial injuries. It's pretty clear that these injuries are going to be really painful. But how should we approach the management of pain in the polytrauma patient? And I think there's several challenges that exist in these patients. One, Have we adequately evaluated the need for analgesia? And two, how do we manage analgesia so that we appropriately consider hemodynamics, yet provide adequate pain control? Dr. Chris Hicks, a colleague of mine and I, published recently an approach to pain in the polytrauma patient. And I'll use this framework that we described to guide our conversation today with a link in the show notes to the paper. I think it's worth noting that we substantially undertreat pain in most polytrauma patients. And I think this happens for several reasons. One, we just rarely ask. Two, we're focused on other priorities. And three, we're worried about worsening the patient's hemodynamics. All right, let's get started. So first, regardless of the circumstances, there's a few things that can be addressed right up front. One, I'll ask the patient about their pain and whether they feel they need something for analgesia. Sometimes patients decline because of uncertainty, so I use this as an opportunity to explain the options. Also, I'll ask one of our nurses to be in charge of evaluating pain control periodically throughout the resuscitation. Two, the hardboards used for transport are really quite uncomfortable, and they provide very little spine immobilization, so when possible, I'll get them off right away. Three, Well, C-spine clearance is a whole separate topic altogether and requires a specific plan. An aspen collar is certainly more comfortable than a hard collar. So when possible, I'll remove the collar altogether if it just isn't required and applied in the pre-hospital setting for something like a penetrating injury. But in a case like this, we don't really have that option. I'll obviously keep it in place until imaging is complete. But if the patient is removing it, it's increasing agitation, and maybe the mechanism isn't so bad, then I'll weigh the benefits and costs of keeping it in place, usually replacing it with some rolled blankets, securing the head with some tape between them. And finally, not an immediate priority, but a Foley catheter can definitely help in patients who won't be able to move around, especially with lower extremity trauma. And for this patient, I'll offer them a Foley if I'm having difficulty managing their pain and they find it difficult to use a urinal. Okay, let's go through an approach that's based on the main factor that will impact our analgesia plan, and that's hemodynamic stability. And we'll divide the patients into four groups. Group one, profound or refractory shock. And these are patients with a systolic less than 70, or it's clear the GCS is altered due to poor cerebral perfusion, or they have poor cap refill. Overall, these are the patients that are significantly unstable. Group two, 
those in sort of shock or occult shock. And these are patients who have a shock index maybe greater than one or intermittent, intermittent hypotension or even sustained hypotension, but less profound, like a systolic of 90. Group three, these are ones that have normal hemodynamics, no other concerns. And then group four, they have normal hemodynamics, but they have a catastrophic injury. For example, an amputation or a massive degloving. So going back to the case, this patient has multiple closed extremity fractures and rib fractures. And I'm going to imagine the patient in each of these four groups. First, the patient presents and they're profoundly hypotensive, a systolic of 68 over 40, a heart rate of 120. Clearly, this isn't a situation where we're looking to administer some morphine and then reassess in a few hours. Rather, this patient requires resuscitation, and while analgesia is likely required, it can't reliably be given safely. Instead, the focus should be directed towards the resuscitation and, and likely intubation. Once the patient stabilizes or following intubation, an analgesic should be provided. I often use ketamine for induction, so that helps me get a little analgesia initially. And then I prefer boluses of fentanyl, usually 25 to 50 microgram aliquots, or I will use ketamine 20 to 40 milligrams, depending on how the hemodynamics are going. At these doses, rarely do I find these negatively uh, impact the hemodynamics. And if I don't seem to get reasonable effect with one, I'll try the other agent and I'll monitor the blood pressure and heart rate. If one agent does seem to work well and the hemodynamics are okay, then I'll start an infusion. For ketamine, Maybe 0.5 milligrams per kilo per hour is a reasonable starting dose, and you can go up from there. Fentanyl, 50 to 75 micrograms an hour. In this case, we intubate the patient. I'll use 30 to 50 milligrams of ketamine for induction, and then another 30 milligrams of ketamine 10 minutes post-intubation, and I'll monitor the heart rate and the blood pressure. Really, I find an analgesia first approach for these intubated patients works quite well, favoring ketamine or fentanyl infusions and then only adding a sedative like midaz or propofol if needed. The caveat is, in the severely head-injured patient, where I will often favor the use of propofol because it helps to facilitate frequent neuro exams, and this is critical for neurosurgical assessments. This obviously is also challenging if the hemodynamics are compromised, but in those cases, I may favor propofol over an analgesia infusion and may just use boluses of analgesia. Also, part of the initial hemodynamic management can be femur fracture reduction. So I may just consider early intubation to help facilitate that femur fracture reduction and Thomas splint application. It is amazing the difference fracture immobilization makes uh, in patients' management of analgesia. Okay, now let's imagine this patient has a better blood pressure, maybe 95 on 40, still in shock, not, a, not quite as profound, but he's GCS 15 and clearly in pain. So I'll start with aliquots of 25 to 50 micrograms of fentanyl, recognizing that it could certainly soften out his hemodynamics, so I'll be cautious. And I'll certainly work to resuscitate the patient, and he'll likely get some blood products. My goal will also be to get the fractures reduced and splinted. If after two to three boluses of fentanyl without adequate effect, then I'll switch over to a bolus of ketamine. And it's really important, I won't just push 10 to 20 milligrams this leads to too many psychotropic side effects. Some patients just freak out and it's really unpleasant. So instead, I'll put 20 milligrams of ketamine in a mini bag and infuse it over 10 minutes as an alternative to just pushing it. If you're going to use a weight-based dose, anywhere between 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams per kilo is reasonable for ketamine analgesia. And this mini infusion strategy is based on an RCT that we'll link in the show notes, which showed substantial reduction of the unpleasant psychotropic effects by using the 10-minute infusion instead of an IV push. And for me, this has really become the standard of, of care and standard practice when I give ketamine for analgesia. Okay, next up, maybe the patient's hemodynamically stable. In this case, I'll start with 50 micrograms of fentanyl and often add ketamine 0.15 to 0.3 milligrams per kilo over 10 minutes, just like I described. Once the patient's undergone CT imaging and it's clear there's no source of bleeding that could worsen hemodynamics, I'll switch over to morphine, maybe 0.1 milligrams per kilo, or hydromorphone, 0.01 to 0.02 milligrams per kilo, and go up from there for a more sustained analgesia instead of having to keep uh, rebolusing fentanyl. 
And now imagine this patient fit into group four. Patient instead, rather than a both bone forearm fracture, has an arm amputation and they're awake. In this case, I'd strongly consider intubation just to manage the pain. And I think this applies to situations of burns or degloving or multiple extremity fractures, really catastrophic injury in a patient who is GCS 15 without hemodynamic compromise. Don't, don't hesitate to intubate if you're really unable or unlikely to get that patient's pain under control. So that's it. To recap, one, always ask the patient and your team about analgesia. Delegate a team member to monitor it. Two, do your best to manage the other elements that might cause pain, the hardboards, collars, splinting fractures, and, and uh, minimizing log rolls. Three, categorize your patient into each of the four groups. Profound shock, more of an occult shock picture, normal hemodynamics, or catastrophic injury with normal GCS and normal hemodynamics. And then calibrate the analgesia accordingly. And four, when using ketamine, Give it in a 100cc mini bag over 10 minutes to minimize those psychotropic effects. And that's it. Thank you. Beautifully summarized. Thank you so much, Petro. I have to admit that when I first started trying out ketamine for analgesia in the ED, I'd push it, and lo and behold, I caused a couple of those nasty psychotropic effects, which made it way more difficult for me and the ED staff to take good care of the patient. And so I pretty much stopped using ketamine for analgesia. Now, with this study suggesting that giving ketamine slowly in a mini bag over 10 minutes decreases the risk of emergency reactions, I think I'll try reincorporating ketamine back into my analgesia strategy for some of these patients. All right, next up is Noor Khatib in our rural EM Quick Hits series, who's going to remind us of the management of the near drowning patient. Hi, everyone. It's Noor Khatib here with another rural quick hit. With the long days of summer behind us, it's time to reflect on some summer cases. Working in rural emerges in the summer, you see a fair bit of summer acuity and mishaps. Traumas from recreational vehicles, heat stroke, fishing accidents gone horribly wrong, and drownings. People often underestimate the strength of tides in Canadian lakes, and I've seen some great athletes struggle under the waves. Associated injuries include hypothermia, aspiration, respiratory distress, and spinal cord injuries due to diving in shallow water or significant falls from height. All right, let's get into the case. I was working on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in a lovely rural town about 30 minutes from a popular touristic lake when a patch comes in saying they're bringing in a 24 and 26-year-old in respiratory distress after a near-drowning episode. The paramedics and patients roll in. I glance at the patients. They were both fully clothed and very wet. One was talking, not on monitors, and was panicking, asking about his girlfriend. The second patient was a 24-year-old female on a non-rebreather with an O2 sat of 86%. And the story unfolds. About one hour ago, they were both taking a swim in the lake when the waves got stronger and stronger and they both struggled to keep their heads above water. The 24-year-old female was submerged for five to eight minutes on and off gasping for air. The patient is brought to shore by three good Samaritans braving the waves, Two nurses on vacation enjoying their Sunday afternoon jumped to help this patient and found her pulseless. CPR was started for about five minutes. By the time paramedics arrived, the patient's GCS was 12, her respirate was 40, and oxygen saturation was 78%. In terms of pre-hospital care, the traditional ABC approach should be used for drowning victims instead of the new CAB approach. What happens really during a drowning? Small amounts of water cause laryngospasm, which leads to hypoxia and loss of consciousness, followed by respiratory failure and cardiac arrest. Predictors of poor outcome include prolonged submersion time, altered mental status, and severe acidemia. Start with airway, breathing, and then circulation. Address these problems in that order. You need a GCS, rectal temperature, blood glucose, and a brief trauma survey. Treat any associated injury as to why the patient drowned to begin with. Was this a sinkable episode or a seizure? Is an ECG necessary to discount any dysrhythmias? Or was this an intentional episode related to suicidal ideations? Supplemental oxygen can be used with patients with mild symptoms, but if their hypoxia persists, they will need positive pressure ventilation using BiPAP. And if things don't get better, they'll need to be intubated. Diagnostic testing depends on the severity of illness. Some ancillary tests to consider are chest x-ray, glucose, glucose, 
trope or ECG if you're worried a cardiac cause may have played a factor in the drowning, and a VBG to check for acidemia. These patients are at high risk for hypothermia, even when it's hot out, so every effort needs to be made to prevent heat loss immediately. Patients with temperatures from 28 to 32 degrees Celsius require active rewarming. These strategies may include forced air, radiant heat, and heat packs, and the goal temperature should be above 34 degrees Celsius. In patients where the GCS is above 13 and oxygen saturation is 95% or above on room air, they may be monitored from four to six hours if the story suggests a significant submersion. After that, if the pulmonary exam is normal and the vitals are normal, the patient is safely discharged home. For our second patient, her oxygen saturations were in the low 80s on a non-rebreather. Her GCS remained at 12 and she was not answering questions appropriately. She was switched to BiPAP for positive pressure ventilation, which improved to 88%. Her rest rate remained quite high and she became more and more tired. Her oxygen saturation did not improve any further. Endotracheal intubation was performed and the patient was transferred to the nearest ICU two hours away from this rural town, where she remained intubated for the next week. What helped this patient ultimately is early positive pressure ventilation and escalation to invasive airway control before deterioration. Now, people ask, what about the water composition? That's not as important as the volume of water. The ingested water causes loss of surfactant, alveolar collapse, and non-cardiogenic edema. Patients require immediate positive pressure ventilation with high FiO2. Abdominal threats are not indicated, do not help, and risk worsening aspiration. There is no role for antibiotics, and initial treatment of drowning indicates close monitoring for infection, but that's three to four days out, and that's due to aspiration of water or vomit. Now, have you heard of dry drowning? I've heard of this from patients. Social media and news outlets have recently warned patients about secondary drowning or dry drowning. Fear from complications of near drowning weeks later. It's important to educate families that the effects of drowning present rapidly and deterioration occurs within hours, not a day or weeks later. So reassure them that that is simply not a thing. Take-home points. Drowning can present with severe respiratory failure as well as hypothermia. Key resuscitation considerations include start with air rate, breathing, and circulation, look into the causes of the drowning episode, positive pressure ventilation, and active rewarming to a goal of at least 34 degrees Celsius. Another great rural EM quick hit on tragically one of the most common causes of death in children. Now, I know most of you are EM providers here, but I just got to say that prevention is really the answer to decreasing morbidity and mortality when it comes to drowning. As healthcare professionals, we really should all be helping to educate people on the basics of water safety, especially when we see patients in the ED with near drowning. And talking about children, let's segue into a pediatric EM topic. It's all over the news in Canada. Unfortunately, polio is back, probably at least partially because the COVID pandemic has made it more difficult to ensure routine childhood immunizations are done. Any which way, here's Sarah Reed to tell us a bit about what we need to know about polio, because I can tell you for one, I can hardly remember a thing about it, except that Neil Young, one of my favorite musicians, the famous Canadian-American folk singer, he contracted polio when he was a kid in the early 50s during the last major outbreak in Ontario. And now a word from our sponsor, Metricade, the experts on scheduling systems. Metricade has set up an expert implementation team, ensuring that every new client gets attention from their most experienced staff from the very beginning. They're making custom training videos for all new clients so that their training materials look exactly like their schedule. The portal is very intuitive. I personally find it really easy to use. If you need some help, they offer one-on-one remote sessions so that no matter your comfort level with electronic tools, you'll walk away feeling confident that you can use the system to its full advantage. If you're interested in a three-month free trial of their standard service, just go to metricade.com slash emcases and sign up. You've likely seen stories about polio in the lay press recently. Back in July 2022, the CDC was notified of a case of paralytic polio in an unvaccinated man from Rockland County, New York, that was caused by a vaccine-derived polio virus. This led to ongoing wastewater surveillance by New York State, and that has identified 43 positive samples from several counties, including New York City. 
Not all of these are genetically linked to that first case, but they do appear to be vaccine-derived polioviruses. While there has not been a confirmed case of paralytic polio in the UK since 1984, some poliovirus was also found in wastewater samples in London recently, and this led to an immunization campaign this summer for kids aged 1 to 9 in London in order to make sure they're up to date. Then, just this week, Toronto Public Health reported lower than normal rates of childhood immunizations, and of course this leads us to be concerned about a potential resurgence of vaccine-preventable illnesses. And the problem for those of us who practice right now is that most of us have never seen these illnesses unless we've done humanitarian work. So I thought we'd do a quick primer on polio. There are three strains of poliovirus, types 1, 2, and 3, and it's an enterovirus that is only found in humans. It's primarily transmitted by a fecal-oral spread, has a long incubation up to 35 days, but the incubation is usually between one and three weeks. And the communicability is greatest around the onset of illness when you have high concentrations of virus in the throat and stool. And the virus can actually be excreted in stool for up to six weeks. Kids under the age of five are more susceptible to infection. So in 1988, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution for the worldwide eradication of polio, and since then, wild poliovirus cases have decreased by over 99% globally. The last case of wild poliovirus that was caught in Canada was in 1977, and the Americas were certified free of wild poliovirus by the WHO in 1994. The last reported case of paralytic polio in Canada was in 1995 and was related to the oral vaccine. So I think we need to talk about the oral vaccine for a minute. This vaccine is still widely used internationally given its ease of administration, and it contains an attenuated vaccine virus. So when the child is immunized with the oral vaccine, this attenuated vaccine virus replicates in their intestine for a limited period, and thus they develop immunity. During this period, the vaccine virus is actually excreted in the stool, and so in areas where the sanitation may not be optimal, this excreted vaccine virus can spread in the immediate community, and this actually can offer some protection to other kids through passive immunization, and then this vaccine virus dies out. Rarely, if the population is seriously under-immunized, that excreted vaccine virus can continue to circulate for an extended period of time and then can mutate, and very rarely that mutation can cause a form that can actually cause paralysis and that's known as a circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. For this to occur, that strain would probably have to be circulating in that un- or under-immunized population for a period of at least 12 months. So really the problem is not with the oral vaccine itself, it's really just what happens when you have low vaccination coverage, because if um, there's good herd immunity, we are protected against both vaccine-derived and wild polioviruses. The risk of that oral vaccine-associated paralytic polio is one per 2.4 million doses distributed, so it's really rare. The inactivated polio vaccine that we use in Canada produces immunity up to 95% after three doses and close to 100% after the fourth dose. So you'll know that those routine immunization schedules really do vary across jurisdictions, but in Ontario, where I work, the inactivated polio vaccine that we give is given at two, four, six, 18 months, and then there's a booster at four to six years. And of course, it's recommended for that routine immunization of infants and children. It's recommended for kids who've missed it on the routine schedule for unimmunized adults. And it's also given as a booster for adults who have been immunized, but are now at an increased risk because of travel or humanitarian missions. So what does it look like clinically? Most people who are infected are asymptomatic, but they can still shed the virus. In those who are symptomatic, there's a spectrum of disease. So in about 25% of people who are infected, the symptoms will last for a few days and looks like every other viral illness. So like fever, fatigue, headache, vomiting, and these uh, symptoms are self-resolving. With increased disease severity, you see muscle pain and stiffness of the back and neck with or without paralysis. And that paralysis can occur in one in 200 infections. The onset of the paralysis usually occurs sort of a week to three weeks after infection. And of course, recovery is possible depending on the damage to those affected nerve cells. But the longer the paralysis persists, the more likely it is to be permanent. And there's something called post-polio syndrome, where it's crazy, after an interval of 15 to 40 years, 30 to 40 percent of people who survive wild-type paralytic polio can develop like a slow, irreversible exacerbation of weakness and even paralysis usually in the limbs that were affected before. Acute paralytic polio is a classic anterior horn cell disease. So pre-immunization was one of the most common causes of acute flaccid paralysis, 
you get um, paralysis in an arm or leg on one side of the body. So it's asymmetric and this progresses from proximal to distal muscle groups. So it's a descending paralysis and it can be associated with fever and meningeal irritation. You can get bulbar involvement. The tone will be decreased. Reflexes are lost early in those affected limbs. You could see fasciculations and the sensory function will be normal. Muscle atrophy develops later due to denervation and immobility. The big issue is respiratory insufficiency, and this can come from a variety of different mechanisms or a combination. So you can get respiratory muscle weakness or paralysis. You can have cranial nerve involvement that causes upper airway obstruction, or you can have central involvement of the medullary respiratory center. And the case fatality rate for paralytic polio is reported as 2 to 5% among children and 15 to 30% for adults, and this is related to the respiratory failure. I must say, I do wonder if these numbers actually reflect a, a lack of access to chronic respiratory support. So polio is an immediately reportable condition to public health, and the CDC defines a probable case as an acute onset of flaccid paralysis of one or more limbs with decreased reflexes, without another apparent cause, and without sensory or cognitive loss. So we should be considering polio in patients who have any acute flaccid weakness or paralysis, especially if the person's unvaccinated or incompletely vaccinated, if they've recently traveled abroad to a place where polio still occurs or where they use the oral vaccine, or have been exposed to a person who recently traveled to one of those areas. From an investigation perspective, an LP will show elevated CSF protein and a pleocytosis, though it's actually uncommon to detect polio virus in confirmed cases in the CSF. Public Health recommends sending two stool samples 24 hours apart. They prefer a nasopharyngeal swab over a throat swab and to also send the CSF. Thanks so much. So add polio to your differential diagnosis of acute flaccid paralysis. You know, there's Guillain-Barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, there's tick paralysis, transverse myelitis, there's toxins like heavy metals, hypokalemia, just to name a few. All right, last but not least, we have pretty fresh off the press, a study that suggests that if we do chest compressions with the head of the bed elevated, we may have better outcomes after cardiac arrest. Here's Swami to explain. There are only two things that have been shown time and again to improve outcomes in cardiac arrest, high quality CPR and early defibrillation. You've heard it before and it stands true today, despite the fact that the scientific community has worked extensively to find other interventions that improve outcomes. Some look promising like eCPR and the application of ultrasound, while others have been considerably less effective or at least inconsistent like epinephrine and targeted temperature management. We've also seen mixed results in targeting improvements in those two key interventions. Mechanical CPR devices haven't been shown to have quite the benefit that we hoped they would over manual CPR, although they can clearly make running a resuscitation simpler. Dual sequence defibrillation is another one of these techniques or modalities that has mounting evidence that supports it in a limited role in specific situations. It's critical that we continue searching for ways to improve cardiac arrest resuscitation despite the failures of many of the studies that we've seen. So what's new and hot? Heads up CPR. The idea with heads up CPR is that instead of the patient lying completely flat, the head and thorax are elevated slightly and compressions are administered in that position. The theoretical benefit here is that heads up CPR allows for venous blood to drain from the brain to the heart, thereby decreasing intracranial pressure, improving cerebral blood flow as a result. In theory, if the cerebral blood flow is improved, neurological outcomes should be improved as well. Of course, theory and physiological explanations are great, but what we really need is data. There are a number of animal model studies looking at heads-up CPR paired with active compression decompression with an impedance threshold device. These studies consistently show that heads-up CPR, along with active compression decompression, improves cerebral perfusion pressure and cerebral blood flow. There's also some limited evidence for improved neurologic outcome in these animal models, but the improved neurologic outcome of a pig may not directly translate to improved neurologic outcomes for a human. We know that animal data doesn't always translate well to humans, but now we do have some early human data. Published in August 2022 in Resuscitation, 
head and thorax elevation during cardiopulmonary resuscitation using circulatory adjuncts is associated with improved survival. This is by Moore and her colleagues. This team enrolled patients in six U.S. pre-hospital systems to receive automated controlled elevation of the head and thorax CPR with an impedance threshold device, which they also abbreviated ACE CPR with ITD. That impedance threshold device, again, is providing the active compression decompression. They took the 227 patients they enrolled and compared them with 5,200 historical controls from high-performing pre-hospital systems that were getting traditional CPR. The automated controlled elevation device progressively raises the head to about 22 centimeters and the thorax to about 9 centimeters while auto CPR is ongoing. So again, they were using a mechanical CPR device as well. The primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge with secondary endpoints looking at ROSC and favorable neurologic outcomes. The study found that after propensity scored matching, there was no difference between the ACE CPR group and standard CPR group in terms of ROSC, in terms of survival to hospital discharge, or in terms of good neurologic outcome. No difference, no statistically significant difference between the two groups. But if you only read the abstract here, you're going to come away with a very different message because what they report was that when ACE CPR was initiated within about 18 minutes, there was a benefit but that wasn't their pre-established primary outcome. In fact, it's unclear if those were even preset subgroups that they wanted to analyze, or this is just data dredging. Let's bring this all down to the take home. Based on this data, should we all be getting automated controlled elevation devices and embracing heads up CPR? The bottom line is absolutely no, not based on this evidence. The data that we have here is simply hypothesis generating. The hypothesis that can be generated from the data that they have here is that if you apply ACE CPR early, there may be a benefit for patients in terms of ROSC, in terms of survival to discharge, and even in terms of good neurologic outcome. But we need a dedicated study specifically looking at those numbers. And, and that's what we don't have. We don't have anything even close to that. The big danger here, I think, is that the abstract seems to imply a real benefit when it wasn't the primary outcome that they set out to find. On top of that, we have the fact that a number of patients were excluded because they were in some EMS systems that they initially included, but then kind of dumped them by the wayside because they said, you know, they're just rolling out. They're just implementing this ACE CPR. Their data isn't ready to be included in our study. So there's a lot of problems here that makes me think we're not even close to ready to instituting this anywhere outside of a study population. What we need is a randomized control trial looking at standard CPR versus the ACE CPR approach. This would give us substantial evidence to move towards this practice. Additionally, we've got to look at the cost of the device as well as whether approaches without the device work. Can I simply elevate the head of the bed and then do my CPR with the patient in that position or maybe even put the patient into reverse Trendelenburg and do CPR? And of course, we can't forget that there's certain training that's going to be necessary in order for people to adequately perform this ACE CPR. All of the paramedics, all of the EMTs that were in this study that were looked at, they all had special training to use the device. While this isn't ready for prime time, all of us involved in cardiac arrest management should be keeping an eye on this space to see what future data tells us. And we should be ready to pivot if this approach proves to offer better care to our patients. For the big summary, I'm super psyched to tell you that we've almost finalized the lineup for the second EM Cases Summit, February 2nd to 4th. Swami will be there, Sarah Reed, Ruben Strayer, Aaron Ciel, Tarlan Hadiety, David Carr, Michelle Clayman, Chris Hicks, Andrew Petrosoniak, Kirsten DeWitt, Ken Milne, Jesse McLaren, Rob Samard, Catherine Varner, Katie Lynn, Burke Tillman, Sarah Fui, Noor Khatib, Mike Betzner, the list goes on and on. So please save the dates. And the other date to put in your calendars is November 2nd, because that's when tickets for the EM Cases Summit go on sale. You'll find them at emcasesummit.com. Again, that's November 2nd at 10 a.m. for the online conference, which will be February 2nd to 4th. Remember that in order to bring you free open access podcasts, blogs, videos, quizzes, just the nuggets, Pearl of the Week, et cetera, et cetera, all those foam goodies from EM Cases, getting tickets for EM Cases Summit will help ensure that we keep on giving you all the stuff for free for years to come.
So what did we learn from this EM Quick Hits? Well, I learned that patients with subsegmental PEs have far from a zero risk of DVTs and bigger PEs and badness. And we should be considering anticoagulation for these folks, at least until they can follow up in a clinic, especially if they have thromboembolic risk factors. I learned that giving ketamine slowly over 10 minutes in a mini bag for analgesia reduces the risk of emergence reactions and a great four-category approach to analgesia in the polytrauma patient from Petro. I learned that the approach to near-drowning patients should be the old ABC, not CAB, with positive pressure ventilation being key, looking up for acidosis, treating the hypothermia to a temp of 34 degrees Celsius. Then there was polio. I'll definitely be adding polio to my differential of acute flaccid paralysis because it's around again. And then finally, I'll keep an eye and ear out for more on heads up CPR because this early data looks pretty promising and makes a hell of a lot of sense. The next EM Cases podcast is going to be a highlight from the last CAPE conference, one of the most thought provoking conversations I think I've had on EM Cases with Grant Innes and Paul Atkinson discussing their article. Saving EM is less more. Now, many of us have been feeling crushed in emergency medicine as of late, and these insightful gentlemen outline where we might have gone wrong in emergency medicine and how we might be able to fix the state of EM to better the whole healthcare system. So, until next time, take it easy. Mm-hmm.